Welcome, everyone. Um, the following talk is up on the screen. Uh, Python as a tool for e-health systems uh, by Diane Follow. Um, Diane uh, is currently at the, at the TUT. Uh, she's a part-time lecturer and PhD student uh, working in e-health diagnostic systems. Um, she's here all the way from Congo, but how long have you been in South Africa? 12 years, 12 years in South Africa. Um, and her, span her French is much better than mine. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Diane. Um, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everybody. And no, I do not give French lessons. It's just too difficult. So yeah, don't ask me. So today I'm going to look talk to you about Python as I use it in my uh, studies. I use it for a real life application. So I use Python as a tool for e-health systems. So to start, what is e-health? E-health is a multidisciplinary area. It puts together medical informatics, business and public health. And it's basically the use of internet and internet related technologies for medical purpose. So in order to use them, we have to get some data. What type of medical data do we get? We get a number of medical data, like patient records. That's one source of data. The patient came in this day, the patient had these symptoms, this is the, out, uh, the treatment that was given to the patient, this is the outcome. And then our machine can then learn from that and predict for a next patient, would this treatment work on this patient or is it more likely to result in death or something? So another type of data we have is images. A lot of imaging in, in medicine, like x-rays. So there's a lot of image processing that can be done using machine learning to check, for example, from an x-ray if a patient has tuberculosis or not. So it can learn from a number of existing patients whose diagnosis is already known, and then we can use it to predict when we get a new patient whether they have uh, the TB or they don't have it. And we also get doctor notes. A doctor can uh, say what process they used to get to their diagnostic. They say, this patient had this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, and because of them together, and because of the age of the patient, and because of the gender of the patient, we can say that this is most likely to be the sickness that the person is suffering from. Now, when you are doing machine learning, you use a number of algorithms. In the field of e-health, some algorithms are used more than others because they come with some advantages. The first one we're going to look at is k-nearest uh, neighbor. This algorithm, when it receives a new sample, what it's going to do is that it's going to compute a distance between that new sample and all existing samples in its training set. Then it's going to calculate which neighbors or which points in the training sets are closest to my sample that I just received that I don't know about, that I don't know its class. And after I've seen that, oh, the closest three people, like in this, in this case here, I just want to see where can I classify this flower with a question mark. The three closest flowers are those three. So I'm going to then say by majority vote, I'm going to say that this red flower is the same class as the purple flowers there. So that's how it works. Calculate the distance, check a certain number of neighbors, k neighbors, like in this case, k is equal to three, and then does a majority vote to classify the new instance. So I now here I say that my new flower is a purple flower. Another algorithm is decision trees. Uh, first, I must say why, why KNN in medicine. KNN in medicine is good because it can, when you take a new example and you say that, oh, this is what I've seen before, this is more likely to be what I've seen before, so I can then, I can uh, assign. But because it doesn't generalize, it's a problem. It doesn't really explain. You can't just tell your patient, uh, I think you have TB because this guy has TB and it kind of looks like you. 
It's like, okay, you need to give me an actual process of thinking. So that's one drawback of KNN. Even though it performs well, in the field like medicine, it's going to be problematic because it doesn't give you a clear explanation of how it got to its outcome. The next algorithm is decision trees, where you look at different features and then you create subtrees to get to a final decision. Like here is how my kids think. Is it mine? Yes, well, I don't want it. Is it not mine? Yes, then it's for me. Or in any case, it's for me anyway. So they don't think properly. And in medicine, it would be like, does this person come coughing? Let's say I want to diagnose TB. Did the person come coughing? Yes. If yes, then I check. Did this person have fever? Yes. Uh, then did this person have a, a, a swelling on their, on their neck? No. And then based on the different tests that I do, I answer yes, no, yes, no, and then I end into a diagnostics. Well, it's most likely for a person to have TB or to the, for that person not to have TB. I'm using TB as an example because that's the field I'm working on, so I'll go there a lot. So the advantage of this is that because it is represented like this, you can easily explain to a doctor because the doctor doesn't know machine learning. The doctor doesn't understand Python. When you put it like this, the doctor can understand how your system got to its decision. So that's why deci uh, decision trees are very good in the field of e-health. And then we have naive Bayes. Naive Bayes, when they get a new instance, they calculate the probability that this instance belongs to a class or not. So I'm going to get a new patient with its, uh, its symptoms or its symptoms, and then I'm gonna calculate, based on what I had before, what is the probability of this person having TB or not. Now, why is it naive? Because it makes an assumption that might be true or might not be true. Like here, I thought data science would be mostly about training models. I just thought it. Is it true, is it not true? Well, that's what I thought. That's how naive base works. It assumes that all the features that are involved in your, in your training are independent from each other. So the fact that you have fever and cough together doesn't mean anything. The fact that you have fever for three months or fever for one month doesn't mean anything. So it just checks, does he have fever? This is the probability of having TB. Did you cough? This is your probability. And then we'll see that, okay, together you have a probability of this much of having TB or not. So that's why it's called naive. It doesn't, really, uh, it doesn't really know what it's predicting. And then we have this one, support vector machine. This algorithm here tries to put positive, let's say positive uh, data points this side and negative data points that side. So I'm gonna put everyone with TB this side, everyone without TB that side, and I'll calculate what is the maximum distance between the two closest points here. So the last person with TB on this side and the last person without TB on this side. What is the margin between those two? So I'll try to maximize the distance between that class there and that class there. That's the purpose of support vector machine. And that's what Derp is trying to implement there. It said, it doesn't get why his girlfriend is angry. And she's like, but you never get it anyway. And he's like, okay, fine. So he wants to have space to think. So to implement it, he asks, can, we, can you go over the sofa there so that we can have the maximum margin between you and I in this room? And needless to say, it did not end well for Derp. Uh, so now we can look at how do we actually implement all this in Python. NumPy, I'm, I'm sure we all know NumPy, is a very popular li library for calculations. So a lot of um, machine learning tasks involve a lot of calculations with arrays, so NumPy helps a lot. And then from scikit-learn, what do we need? We're going to import a data set uh, module. The data set modules come with pre-existing pre public data sets, okay? So sklearn already gives you some existing data sets that you can try when you're starting to learn, you can try your, uh, yourself on. And then we're going to, imp uh, to import all the different algorithms that we're going to use 
In this case, we're import importing decision trees. We are importing support vector machines. And then we will import the KNN, and then we import naive base. Which type of naive base am I importing? I'm importing Gaussian naive base. Gaussian naive base is just works well when the features are not binary. When your features are um, integers or doubled, it works well if you're using Gaussian naive base. And then I'm also going to import train test split and cross valve score. I will show you later uh, how I use them. So here, there is this nice library, this eHealth library that sklearn comes with. It's called the breast cancer uh, data set. So how do you obtain it? You just call dataset dot load, load breast cancer. And then it returns this as a NumPy array that I call dataset there. And then I can divide it into my x, which is all my features, and then my y, which is the classification whether the person has breast cancer or not. And then I can split my data set into a training set and a test set, because most machine learning tasks require you to learn from your training set and then test the accuracy of the model that you built. So sklearn also comes with that built in. I just call this function training test split. I want to split my x and my y, and then I say my test size, I want my test set to have a, a size of 20% of the, uh, the overall data set. And it creates for me a train set and a test set right there. And if you try to display data sets like I did there, you will then get all the details about the data set that I'm using. You got all the features that I'm using, and then it will display to you every instance that I get. So what feature did instance number one have? What class did it belong to? What feature did uh, number two have? What class did it belong to? And so on. The next step after I've loaded my data set and created my training and test set is for me to now train my models. Very easy again in scikit-learn. All I do is I create an instance of the model that I want to, to train. Like here, I want to create an SVM model. So I call the SVC function, and then I fit this function to my training data. So the moment I do this, the model now learns from X train and Y train that I, I got uh, on the slide earlier. And I'm going to do this for all the algorithms that I'm using. So for SVM, I go there, I create an SVM uh, instance, I train it, then I create a KNN instance, I train it using my training data, I do the same for decision trees, and I do the same for naive base. So there I, I have my models, they are trained, and the model is stored into this NB object that I created. Then, I can then use my model, my created model, to now predict on my test set. So all I do is to say, I, I, I took one example, I'm using the naive base algorithm. So with the naive base, I'm predicting on the, the, the test set. So here, it displays to me everything that my model predicted, okay? And I can then evaluate with what accuracy my model has predicted on the, the test set. I can just say NB score, X test, Y test. So what it's going to do now is compare this that I got here with the actual values that are inside of Y test. And I see here that I get an accuracy of 0 0.95. So 95% of the, the test sets instances were predicted correctly. Another way that I can do, instead of doing this, I can use cross-validation. Why would I use cross-validation? To just make sure that my model is not too fit to the data. So I want to prevent overfitting. Overfitting is when your model does well on the training data, and the moment it gets new data that it's never seen before, it just doesn't know what to do anymore because it was so well tailored to fit your training data. So I want to reduce my chances of overfitting. So what do I do? I do cross-validation. What it's going to do is that I'm going to take my entire data set and divide it into folds. In this case here, I'm doing a five-fold cross-validation. So I divide my data set into five folds. And I do five iterations. 
Through each iteration, I consider four folds as my training set and one fold as my test set. So you see here, iteration number one, the last fold is my test set. Everything else is the training set. Iteration number two, uh, the fourth fold is my training set. Uh, sorry, it's my test set, and everything else is the training set, and so on. So it's going to go through five iterations each time. Use the training set to fit, and then use the test set to predict and test. And how do I implement this? I also have a function. That's what I called, uh, I imported earlier with sklearn. I imported cross val score. So what is going to do? Cross val score, I tell it, I want to cross val score which model? In this case, I want to try naive base. Okay, what, am I, what data am I working with? I'm working with X and Y. And how many folds do I want to use for my validation? I want to use five folds. So every time it's going to take my data set, the entire thing, divide it into five. First iteration, it uses one fold as a test set, and I'm getting an accuracy of 92%. And the second time, I'm getting accuracy of 92, 96, 95, then 96. And I can then use the average to say that this is how, on average, my system is going to predict on something that it hasn't seen before. And using NumPy, I can actually calculate the mean of the result returned. Remember, when you saw here, my crossbar returned an entire array. It returned the, the score, the accuracy score that I got at every iteration. In this here, I'm getting now the average from each iteration. So for my naive base, I'm getting an average um, accuracy of 94. Uh, with the, the decision tree, I'm getting an average accuracy of 91. With the SVM, I'm getting a very bad accuracy of 63%. And then with my KNN, I get a 93. What's important to note here is that each model has got hyperparameters. So you have to uh, change those parameters. It's one of the most important parts of the machine learning process especially in a field like medicine where accuracy is very important, you need to tune your hyperparameters. And tuning hyperparameters in the SVM will, like uh, changing the kernel, will actually try to improve the performance of this classifier. So on my concluding notes, why would we then use eHealth? eHealth is good because it saves time. If my doctor has a screening system there, that at least gives him an idea that this person might have TB or start looking for something else, then my doctor doesn't have to go through each person. He already has an idea, and then it saves him some time. It saves time for the patient as well. If I can be diagnosed on time, let's say for the problem with TB in this country is that TB is endemic. There's a lot of TB in this country. So the World Health Organization says, because of how big TB is, how big the burden is, whenever you get someone showing symptoms of TB, treat them. So when someone looks like they could have TB, before they make sure, before they get all the results after two weeks, three weeks, they start treating them. Now, there are patients who have lymphoma that looks just like TB sometimes, and they get treated by TB because why? Because of this systematic treatment they have to receive. And they're wasting time because their cancer is now progressing while they're busy receiving TB treatment that they don't need. So having a system like this, making it able to pre-screen pa patients and say that this patient should be biopsied instead of being treated straight away for TB will save time for the patient as well. Um, okay. Next, it allows the patient, each one of us, to have a knowledge of their state of health. If I have my doctor's data available online, I can check, how did I do this year? How did my family do this year? When did we do better? Did it get better when we got vitamins? Did it get worse during winter? What, how can we prevent it next year? I myself have a better understanding of my health. And I can go as well online again, because that's another form of information again, and check online and see, huh, this is what is recommended for a person like me, and this, this, and that. 
So it gives you a good insight into your personal health. Another thing is that it saves costs. If the doctor doesn't have to do everything on by, by himself, first of all, he doesn't have to drive to the hospital. Using eHealth, I can go here, connect to my computer, a patient connects to their computer at home, they don't have to pay for transport, I don't have to pay for transport, and then I decide if this person needs to actually go to the hospital or if really I would just tell them they have the flu. So it really saves costs, so it is a very important field in uh, countries like South Africa where a lot of people do not have access to primary health care because they live too far or because they don't have the, the financial means. So it is very, uh, it's a field that should be really implemented in Africa in general as well. Thank you, and I will now take your questions. Ah, we have a question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, the decision tree is the only one I really understood, um, like how it would work practically. Um, how would some of the others work practically in like a doctor-patient setting or, yeah? The thing is, in a doctor-patient setting, the doctor generally doesn't uh, have access to that back-end Python. The doctor doesn't know what's happening in the background. The decision tree, the advantage is that the doctor is also in the know, but the others will work, but because it's like at the back, the doctor will just see the interface. The doctor sees the interface, enters its, uh, his data or the patient's symptoms, and gets a result. With decision tree, that's just the advantage that he can now see the whole process, how it got to his result. Yeah. Did I answer your question? So the, the patient's data would be input in, in all cases, no matter what, what model you're using. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. For you to actually uh, predict, you need to say, this is what the patient has, or in, in some cases could be not just typing, eh? it can be the images like the x-ray, or it can be vital signs. So you oh, can I have see. like okay. a system monitoring your vital signs, and that becomes an input that is fed into your system. Okay, got it. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Another question here? Uh, hi. Um, hey. So I just wanted to know, obviously eHealth uh, is quite sensitive data. Um, and a, something like a false positive or a true negative could be deadly. How would you deal with something like that? Well, that's one thing that you must make sure that e-health must not be used on its own. A doctor always has to have the final say. That's why, according to the law, if I make my system, my system cannot give a final diagnosis. This is what you have and go and do this. The doctor has to approve. So. You have to minimize those risks, but there should still always be a human factor. Yeah. Hi. Uh, from public health and epidemiological point of view, there are some diseases which have low incidence. How do uh, the models which you have presented deal with the class imbalance? whereby you have uh, a law, uh, the, the classes which you are looking at, like instant of TB, maybe it's 5%, and the other one is 95%. And your accuracy might be 95%, but it is all classifying bias to one class. How does these models deal with such a problem? Are you, if I understand, are you saying that uh how do we deal with the uh, class continuous? imbalance? Whereby class imbalance. Yes. Uh, in many cases, when there's class imbalance, when I'm tra when I'm training, ne, I can make up data. Uh, what do you call them? Artificial data. So you create artificial data, not just out of the blue. They follow the statistics of the existing data. So if I have patients. A, B, C, D, let's say I have 100, and the other one I have 1,000. But I can see the curve of how patient 100 for this class are going. I can manufacture 
artificial data to multiply, to multiply the number. Or another thing is I can use, um, what do you call them, uh, bagging. Do you know bagging is where I, when I train, ne, I use this example more than once. I use this example repeatedly like five times to make my training set bigger. So those are two methods that are used to make sure that you kind of help with class imbalance. And SKLearn also comes with some uh, classes that some modules that actually allow you to just with a function send your data and then it rectifies the class imbalance for you. I didn't include that there, but scikit-learn is also there for that. Um, about the hyperparameters, yeah. how did you um, get them to tune effectively without choosing them arbitrarily and also in the tests when you determine the number of faults, that seems like an arbitrary number. How do you deal with that? What do you mean uh, in the test? For example, um, testing the effectiveness of a model with mm. um, cross-validation. Mm -hmm. The number of faults seem to be arbitrary. Oh, the number of faults. Like, yeah. how do you choose that number uh, better? Even the number of faults is also part of the, that you're testing. During your testing, you kind of check how did it perform with three folds? How did it perform with five folds? How did it perform with ten folds? And you kind of see that, okay, I should use this number of folds. And then with the hypertuning, there's another great tool with SKLearn. It's called Grid Search CV, Grid Search Cross Validation, where you tell it, check all the parameters A, B, and C for this model within this range. So I want to check, um, uh, what can I say? Decision tree. I want to uh, check decision tree with a depth of 5 or 10 or 100. I want to check. So now when you run with the grid search, ne, it's going to go check everything with all the hyperparameters together. And it tells you this is how, much it, how the best one performed. And these were the hyperparameters that were used. So you can look into grid search CV. It, it helps with that. Any other? Oh, here was a question. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly. Go directly to the mic. Directly. Hello. <laughs> um, the accuracy of the machine learning versus the accuracy of the doctors, because there obviously is that small percentage, but the question is whether that small percentage that it gets wrong is smaller or bigger than the percentage the doctors get wrong. Sometimes the machine performs better. There are cases where the machine has performed better. In my, in my research, there's actually one of the, the things that I have to research. I have to, after I've trained my model, I'm going to test it with the model, and then the doctors also have to give the diagnostics, and we're going to check if it performed better or worse or equally. So sometimes it performs better, sometimes it can perform worse, and you just have to try and tune it to perform better. So will you use the, the different types? on that test, sorry. <laughs> Will you use the different um, types of machine learning on from, that? Just for my research? Yeah. Yeah, um, I have to check for which one is going to kind of work best, and then I uh, tune the hyperparameters to make sure that I get the best, best of all the best that I've used, and then compare that one to the human counterpart. Cool, another question on this side. Uh, hi, I missed the very beginning, so this might have been answered. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been very excited about the possibility of machine learning for diagnosis in health. Uh, is this, um, at the moment, uh, theoretical, these methodologies, or is it actually being used at hospitals, firstly? And secondly, where is the data being stored? Is it, is it in one database at one hospital, or is it being shared across hospitals, or uh, just kind of cu uh, curious how that works? So the first question was, uh, is it implemented? Yes, it is implemented. I forgot the name of the first system, but the first system to ever be implemented was using Naive Base, even, and it showed a very good performance. But in countries like South Africa, it's not. Because there's also the problem of people accepting technology. So people accepting technology and uh, what do you call them, policies. There's a lot of policy in South Africa. He helped this, he helped that but then it ends on paper, and it's not actually being implemented. 
And it's actually something that I have to look into. Why? Why does it stay a policy and is not being implemented? But e-health is one of the goals of South African Health, to help improve it. But it's not really, really... Every doctor I talk to really doesn't really have an idea what I'm talking about. And I forgot the second question. Um, sorry, just wh where is the data stored? Is, is it like by a company, by government, decentralized? Uh, in South Africa, they want to implement this patient record service. Um, I forgot what it's called. But they want to have like a central patient record service for all the public hospitals. Now, I don't know how far they, they have gone with that. But I'm, I know they started implementing that. So that's one type of data you're going to have. And each, each practice actually has its own data. So it's up to the practice to decide. I want to now learn, me as a doctor, I want to learn what's happening in my practice. Then I can then learn from my data. And there's also this public data that you actually get. That's just, uh, OK, this clinic or this hospital decided to publish this for research purposes. So you get a bunch of public data sets. But when it comes to getting the ones from the patients from the hospital, there's just to keep in mind, there's a lot of ethics involved. A lot of ethics. All the ethics flags need to be checked before one has access to them. So it's sometimes, most of the time, it's actually very difficult to get access, even when the data exists. Yeah. Any other questions? No. On this oh? yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, when it comes to uh, radiology, uh, you mentioned uh, that you're using uh, images. Yeah. Are you taking uh, the radiologist report into consideration? Yeah, you can. Because the radiology, uh, radiologist report is some textual data. so. I don't know where it is. My computer is such a mess. I actually downloaded this x-ray data set where you get the, the notes as well. So you get the data set, then you get the patient's notes. So you can run your algorithm. I, for me, I feel like you run two separate algorithms because the ones that work best for the image are not, are not always the one that works best for the text. So you can use like deep learning for your images, and then you see, oh, it classified as this, and then you use also uh, whatever algorithm for your text and say that, oh, it's classified as this, and you kind of balance or vote which one you're going to go with. So you do get multiple type of data like that, and you can use them together. Yeah. In terms of the comment on the public health, uh, we are a little bit there. Uh, remember the in, in, in South Africa, you get, you are contracted to the province. Mm. So the the data is there. The, you have a hospital information systems, and to some degree the uh, primary health care, but is, it is with the province. So and then the doctors hardly use the system because of the workload, but the data is still captured by uh, case managers as well as the as the clerks. So which we mainly use for for billing and uh, EDI integration with the, uh, with the medical schemes. So okay. there's, there, there's a bit of uh, work that is happening. And then in the provinces, we also have a master patient index, uh, the, the, the cross-province uh, uh, data sharing. And then the, the CSIR is working with the Department of Health to have a national uh, master patient index, which would pretty much be agnostic of which solution the province has because uh, the province uses the, the CH CSIR have published what they call health normative standards, which is basically based on the IHE framework. So it means whichever uh, solution you have, as long as you talk to the uh, health normative standards uh, with all those HL7 message exchanges, it, it shouldn't matter which solution the province chooses because the provinces are autonomous, so they can go out on, on their own tender and choose their own solution. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? No. Thank you very much. Uh, uh,